pray. Amen. Uh, I will never forget the day we sat down and we had a discussion about this as well, Pastor. And uh, before I even start, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share a little bit about the book. So now let's talk about the book. Uh, the book is called From the Inside Out. Uh, I kind of changed the title a little bit. Uh, choosing a Relationship with God. All right. It's written for young men. Uh, Mr. Austin and Mr. Caleb and the youth group that did the, such an outstanding job two weeks ago, uh, they motivated me. You, you guys have always motivated me, and I want to to give back to you somehow. Uh, Austin made a comment last two Sundays ago that he was there was a book that was written that would address some of the things that young men come in contact with on a day-to-day basis. And so, Austin, uh, I wrote that book. And, uh, and just to let you in on a little inside tip, whenever it's out, it should be out by July, I will be giving a free copy to the young men of this church. All right? Because I'm only addressing a few things, and I'm not addressing everything. You need to write a book. You need to read the book. All right. So uh, what led to writing, writing this book? Uh, I was looking around, and I was seeing life on a day-to-day basis. And what really bothered me with life as it is today is it's sort of like an I generation, lack of consideration. There's a lack of caring, a lack of compassion, a lack of consideration for other people. And since God is the head of man, and man is the head of his house, he's the head of the woman, uh, I feel like it's really important for men to reestablish our roles. We need to be what God created us to be, all right? And, and it bothered me. Uh, my military, years of military, they always trained us. If you have a problem, then you need to come with a solution, at least three. Three things that you can use to solve that problem. Otherwise, you're just whining and nobody likes whiners. All right? So I decided to write the book. All right? Because it's not just enough to stand by and criticize and say, well, this generation, you know. This, you, man, you guys, ah, when I was younger, we didn't do this. But when I was, you know. No, we have to help uh, young people. And I felt obligated as a Christian as a man, to step forward and say, look, here's my, my uh, contribution to the young generation, because you guys are the future. And that is partly the reason why, uh, that is the main reason why I started working with the youth group on Thursdays, because, yeah, I wrote the book, but now I need to see what are you guys going through on a regular basis. And, whoa, you, you sit in on some of the prayer, and I encourage the parents to come out with your kids sometimes to these youth groups and pray with them and see what they are going through on a day-to-day basis, and you'll understand, uh, yeah, man, I need to pay a little bit more attention. All right, Maybe I need to pray with them a little bit more uh, because they are going some some serious issues, deaths, deaths in their lives, suicides, bullying, uh, low self-esteem. These are the types of things that are addressed during Thursdays for youth groups, in case you want to know. All right? Uh, so uh, I feel that God uh, placed man on this earth to do two things. In Genesis, he talks about dressing and keeping. We are to dress and keep what God put under our charge. All right? So as men, uh, we need to step up to the plate. The book address three points uh, God wanted to uh, discuss through Micah to the nation of Israel, uh, through uh, the Sumerians and in Jerusalem, three points. And uh, those points were to do justly, to love mercy, and to uh, walk humbly with God. Those points were designed to create a relationship God did not want us to sacrifice rams and human sacrifices and give monetary expensive oil and oils and alabaster boxes and all that. That's all good. And the intent was 
good according to the Mosaic laws. All right. But the point was missed. And the point was that he wanted a relationship. He wanted us to be in a relationship with him. All right. So that led to Jesus coming down to earth and sacrificing himself so we could all have a chance. Each of these directives are discussed. And at the end of each uh, directive and at the end of each chapter, there is a self-reflection part that asks questions about, okay, well, how do you uh, do good? How do you do justly? How do you step toward loving mercy? And when those two are done, how do I walk humbly with God? All right, these are the three points that are brought out. The points that I'm going to talk about this morning are the freedom of choice, changing your mindset, and the effects of mercy. And all, these, all of these areas are touched in the book. All right? So, freedom of choice, uh, if you will, Mr. Charles. Freedom of choice, uh, one of the biggest examples to me that I found when writing this book, and I use this illustration, uh, Cain and Abel. It, it, I wish that God could talk to us like he did with the, the original inhabitants of the world, like Adam, Eve. He still talked to Cain, he talked to Abel. And Cain was upset because his sacrifice was not approved. Abel, uh, Abel, you know, God embraced, he, he accepted his sacrifice. But Cain, be, uh, Cain became wroth. He became upset, he became discontent because uh, God rejected his sacrifice. All right, and you see on the slide, I, ha I have uh, God's comment to Cain. He said, if thou doest well, shalt, not, uh, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, sin's desire, to take you over. And thou shalt rule over him. And I have read this in different versions, the NIV, but I like this one. And the reason I like this one is because God, he let Cain know, you can do this, man. You don't have to let sin rule over you. You have the power to say no. He had the power to choose. And in the book, I sort of highlighted some of the things I wrote. I wrote the book, and Pastor, I, sometimes I had to reread it because most of this book was written between the hours of 3 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning. It was wee hours of the morning. Uh, but Cain had a choice. He could choose to get a better sacrifice. All right? Instead of being discontent, uh, he had the opportunity to not just settle for the sacrifice that he kept giving to God and God kept rejecting him. He had a choice. He did not have to kill Abel. He could have chose a better sacrifice. And that is what I want to extend to the young uh, men in this group and to everyone else. You do not have to keep giving up the same uh, sacrifices that you've been given. Choose a different one. Choose a better one. Change your path. All right? And that is the message that I, that I want to send to the younger, the younger people out here. The, uh, some of the examples of better choices. Uh, turn the other cheek instead of fighting. All right? Now, that doesn't mean let somebody beat up on you. Take your martial art classes. I'm a martial artist. You know, take your, defend yourself. Uh, you do need to report it to the police if you get assaulted. You know, so you do live in this world. You turn out the cheek, but you also, you need to defend yourself as well. Let the other person get in the last word instead of continuing the argument. You do not have to finish the argument. All right, and there's one, uh, according to relationships. I've done this in my marriage. Apologize for the offense, even though you might be right. <laughs> I have, uh, I call it in, in my write-up, it's a de-escalation of force. <laughs> you know, let's de-escalate this a little bit, all right? 
uh, in the military, they have what they call rules of engagement and this, this type of thing. And what you want to do is you want to de-escalate it. Baby, I don't have to be right. You know, and, and, and just let her know, you know, I if I offended you in any way, I apologize. How hard is that? And, you know, and without, without minimizing it, without marginalizing it, you know, and say, look, you know, we can't go to sleep tonight angry at each other, so, you know, we might as well hug each other, kiss, make up. All right. And, and just make it right. But the bottom line is you do have another choice. You don't have to continue to keep arguing because there are other things you can do, like go to the movie and watch Captain Marvel or something, something good, you know. Uh, and then last, but choose not to allow other people to take you there. I define there as there is that point at which your final nerve has been touched. <laughs> that is there. Don't, don't allow people to take you there. When I was in my 20s, I drew lines in the sand constantly. I was very bad at it. Uh, I, you know, God loves us unconditionally. He wants us to love others as we love ourselves. Therefore, we need to learn how to love people unconditionally. And I drew, there wasn't a line that I did not draw in the sand. And so that is something that, you know, just choose not to allow people to take you there. You know, make a, make a different choice. All right? Um, we cannot change the inevitable. I, if you could pull up slide four. This is a, a quote from Mr. Charles Swindoll. It says, we cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the string we have. And that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitude. Uh, that is by Mr. Uh, Swindle. And I love that quote. I've heard it before, but I've never knew who exactly wrote it. And, uh, uh, that is, uh, those are words we can use to apply to ourselves. You have 90% of the things going on around you or... 90% of how we react to it and 10% of the things that, that happen around it. In other words, don't let it affect you like that. Let God's word affect you like that. All right? The, uh, in the Bible, God says it a little bit differently. He says, uh, according to Paul, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. What has worked for me is to not allow other people to affect my mood that way. You say something I don't like, I'll get quiet. And I've found out that quiet and methodic really doesn't work in the civilian world like that because people don't like it. But for me, it gives me time to assess everything, what just happened here. It gives me time to walk away as parents. When your child says something and it just strikes that, they took you there, let it go. You know, come back, think about it, assess it for a while, and then come back. Because once you start yelling, you've lost them. All right. Uh, and that is something that I had to apply to my life when my son came to live with me for a year. Ooh, he was 17 years old, and uh, he pushed those But He took me there on a daily basis. But... Uh, but I never raised my voice to Joshua. I always, it took me a couple days, but I came back and I talked to him. And that works so much better than uh, going over the top, coming off the top rope. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is changing your mindset. All right. Uh, in the book, I talk about running. I love to run. Uh, can't help it. It was a military thing, I guess. But I've been, I was running even when I was a kid. And I changed my mindset one day. I realized that I had been running from my relationships. I had been running from my past. I had been running from a lot of things uh, when I grew up because it was a rough, it was a rough uh, childhood. I grew up on the west side of Chicago, and well, my saving grace was I grew up in a Catholic church. I was educated under the archdiocese. So it's a serious mix, you know. Um, 
And so I found myself, I wanted to get away from my life in the past. And people who are 50 years old still running away from things that happened to them when they were five. I believe it was mentioned last Sunday. Your, your maturity as a child, you, you, it's developed by the time you're five years old. And so people still react to things that happened to them when they were children. So you change, I changed my mindset. Instead of running from things, I started running toward them. I started running toward God instead of running away from the devil, if that makes sense. All right? And so I, I put up this slide. I don't know if you can see the words, but when I saw this picture, there's so many things that we could change our mindset about, our values, uh, the things we invite into our lives the things we let go of in our lives, uh, the things we embrace, the things we sense, uh, the things we feel. All of these things can be changed. We could change our mindsets to react to it differently. And the, the, the closer we get to God, the more our mindsets change in his direction. And that was the biggest takeaway Last, last Sunday, we talked about casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing them into captivity, um, every thought to the obedience of Christ. The only way that we can do this is to read the word and get closer to him. God said, if you draw nigh unto me, I will draw nigh unto you. Flee the devil, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. All right? It didn't say run away from the devil. It just said resist. And draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. And that is uh, in, in another way of changing your mindset. Mr. Charles Swindoll also wrote one more quote that I, I wanted to bring up. Anything under God's control is never out of control. And if we could just put it, learn, young, young people, old people, if we could just Condition our minds to just say, Lord, what do I need to do about this situation? Put it, put it to God first. Literally, I became a new creature through the renewing of my mind. Uh, it talks about this in Romans uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 2. And at this point, after changing my mindset, I started to realize I am becoming a new creature. My life is changing. I don't react to it the, way, the same way I used to react. And I got tested on this recently. Uh, and it's not the people who are not close to you to get you, that take you there. It's the people that's the ones you love the most, man. The ones that's right next to you. Those are the ones that, that get you. All right? And I turned around, and then instead of reacting in, in the mask that you said, or the, the mask of hypocrisy and going back to the old person, I told them, I love you. I don't think you're right about this situation, but I do love you. You know, and I, that is all a part of becoming that new creature. Because I wouldn't have said that in my 20s. It would have went totally different. To, uh, I, in the book I mentioned about, uh, I, think I quit running from my past, but that does not necessarily mean I did not face my demons. I went back, and my relationship with my father was strained, uh, to say the least. That's putting it mild. And I questioned things uh, about uh, my childhood after I started having children. And I asked my dad, did you love me? Did you even love me when I... Am I somebody else's kid and you didn't tell me? You know, or, or what is it? But I confronted my dad. And... Uh, God rest his soul, after, before he passed away, because he, he succumbed to cancer, we, we made our relationship better, you know. And I got to talk to him, and we got to settle things out, and our relationship got better. It got stronger, all right? So, yes, you will have to face your demons. But when you're doing that, I just need you to remember one thing, and that is what's on the screen. Next, uh, next slide, Mr. Shaw. To put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against 
uh, principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this world, of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not always that person. Sometimes, you know, you would not believe, and we, you pastor prayed for me, over me, with a few other uh, church members before coming out here. You would not believe my week. I'm like, the things that they popped into my head all week, and I'm like, where is that coming from? You know, and so I had to pray about this. I had to get my mind right. I had to get my soul right before I come before you guys. All right? And, and I... And I I would say that, yes, I am wrestling against spiritual wickedness. Because the Lord doesn't, this world and the devil does not want to see young men prosper. He does not want to see the young people that I see in youth group every Sunday grow and develop into productive human beings. All right. So that motivated me to, and sparked me to move even and more to get ready. I've been actually fasting for this because I wanted to uh, be able to deliver something that would, would promote these young people. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, when you change your mindset, you need to change what you're thinking about. It, they, I believe the definition of insanity is expecting different results, doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's hard to do, but it's possible. Whatever so things are true, whatsoever are things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good rapport, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. God, he gave us, and again, Austin said it too, yeah, we need a book, and we have one, it's called the Bible. God gave us the things he wanted us to think about. He put it right there, I just said it. There are so many other things that he wants us to think about. He wants us to engage things differently. Christ, I believe Pastor Mike brought it up before, long, uh, a few sermons ago. Christ is, if we could be in perfect harmony with God, we'd be exactly like Christ. Christ was in perfect harmony with God, and that is what we were created to be. That's our original image, to be in perfect harmony with God. We didn't fall... We didn't come out of perfect harmony with God until we fell. And then the last topic that I want to discuss are the effects of mercy. In the book, I wrote that God's requirement is to love mercy. In fact, it's an invitation for us to emulate his very nature. All right. By loving mercy, we're given an alternative to change the outcome and move in a new direction. And it goes hand in hand with changing our mindsets. All right? When you, when you use verbally to actively desire mercy, God wants us to love mercy. And when I, I defined it in the book, and the final result was it is to actively, actively desire something. Later on in the chapter, I asked people, uh, I asked young men, what do you actively desire? Two of the examples that I used was maybe you're desiring or actively pursuing a relationship. Maybe you have a dream girl that you want to marry someday, and you actively pursue her until the wedding bells ring. Or maybe there is a job that you are pursuing. Or maybe there's a title that you want. So you go to school, you get the education, you get the experience, and then finally, bam, you get the, that, that job, the job. God wants us to actively pursue mercy the same way we actively pursue uh, that, that dream girl or that job that you want or whatever it is you desire in this world. He wants us to desire mercy the same way. And I put in the book that it's ironic that the one thing that God wants us to actively desire is the one thing we lack the most. We are merciless. <laughs> Uh, we, 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 you don't have to believe me. Just re look at the news and you see the things that's going on in the world. And uh, I have seen them firsthand uh, through the military. Uh, we don't live in a very compassionate world right now. 
And God would have it that he wants us to change that. He wants us to actively pursue mercy. To actively desire it. In chapter 9 uh, of the book, I asked the reader about those things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are times in all our lives when we are going to need somebody to show us a little bit of mercy. There's nobody in this room that does not require mercy at some point. I give a few examples. Late on a bill, you know, you, you need a little mercy on that one. You know, I, got, I get paid next Friday. Can you give me the next Friday? All right. Uh, you fell ill, causing you to perform less than uh, what's expected. You, you get sick. For uh, many of us, you get sick, you still got to go to work. All right. But it would be nice if your boss could give you a break and say, look, I'm not feeling well today. Can you give me, I, I need some time to recover. All right. The, uh, on the same issue, there are other things. You know, the babysitter uh, didn't show up. It was a snow day, and you still have to go in, but your child doesn't. That creates an emergency where you need mercy of your boss. All right, because now you got to figure out, what am I going to do with my child all day? Because you can't leave them at home. They're not at that age yet. So those are just some of the examples that we need from day to day in everyday life for mercy. One of the uh, revelations that I had is that mercy is given and it keeps us going. If we keep showing each other mercy, the well of hope will never run dry. Mercy gives us another chance. And when I thought about that, I was like, wow, you know, if, if you forgave me, and these are some of the examples I gave for this. Criminals who are trying to change but cannot find work because there's no one that will give them a chance. Then finally, they land the first job because somebody gave them a chance. Somebody said, look, you can come work for me. As long as you do a good job and you don't rip me off, we fine. And give the person a chance. Another one, addictions uh, can cause rips in family. Somehow you find the strength to recover because one family member decided to believe in you. Uh, Tracy, uh, my wife, she works in Texas. She works for a place, it's a rehab center. And she deals with this all the time. And yeah, it requires tough love. You have that one person left, that one family member, that father, mother, whoever. I'm going to give you one more chance. I will foot the bill. The only thing you have to do is complete this program, this 12-step program, and admit that you're an addict. Complete the program, take one day at a time, and then you can begin to recover. But it takes the mercy of that individual to give them that chance. And then you make a mistake in your marriage. It is so important for the spouse to forgive them. And there is nothing more uh, beautiful than to see uh, your spouse say, baby, I forgive you. Or just show it. But nothing is worse than being nagged over something you did 12 years ago. You know, you made a mistake. People make mistakes. If there is a will to have a, a prosperous marriage, if that other person is willing to work with you and say, look, I want to I'm married, I want to grow old and die with you, then I think it's worth the effort to, to forgive them and move on with your life and have mercy on that person. When Jesus' uh, acts of mercy can be redeeming for both the person who it is expressed to and the person it's granted to. All right. And one of the stories that came up to mind was Jesus and the adulteress. She committed adultery. The people were getting ready to stone her to death because under Mosaic laws, adultery is punishable by death uh, through stoning. Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman because at this point, Jesus said, look, if any of you guys standing here, if you're without sin, you'd be the first you know, to cast a stone. And so they thought about it. And they were like, I guess there won't be a stoning today because I've sinned and, I, and I, I don't have a right to kill this lady when I know I'm guilty. 
All right. So when Jesus had lifted himself up, he saw none but the woman, and he said to her, Woman, uh, where, are, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I'm sure after that day, that lady did just that. I didn't die today because of this. You know, and, and it, she just needed something to keep her going. You know? The other side of the story is that the accusers, they had to do a self-assessment. They had to look at their own conscience, and they had to evaluate themselves. They had to ask themselves, where do I stand in life right now? Right now, I have a lady standing there. I have a rock the size of my hand ready to hit this lady and stone her to death. But, uh... I was, I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing last night, too. I was doing something that I shouldn't have done, too. So it, it forces the other person to do a self-check, to check their own conscience. God says, uh, but I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Again, going, being prior military, this is not the mindset that they, that they give you. You, know, you become a mission. You know, uh, the first thing that you think about is retaliation. The last thing you think about is loving your enemy. All right. And this is one of those things that, that God is working on me with, uh, given the uh, amount of years that I've had with that old mindset, uh, to love your enemies and to pray for them. All right, to love unconditionally. It took me a while just to get past drawing lines in the sand. Now you want me to love my enemies too? But yeah, it, we are called to go back to what we were originally designed to be, uh, created in, in God's image. Be ye therefore merciful as, uh, as your God, our, your Father in heaven is also merciful. And I would like to add to that, that uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You will get it back. If you're giving it out, you will get it back. What you reap, you will sow. So if you extend mercy to people, if you, you know what, man, it ain't even like that. You know what, have a blessed day. I love you. And, and pastor might put a challenge to out to all of us to go out, tell people, have a blessed day. I got some crazy reactions after that. I, instead of saying, uh, have a good day, I say, have a blessed day. And people are like, what do you mean by that? You know? but, uh, but yeah, showing, showing people a little bit of mercy, it goes a long way. And uh, sometimes you, re you sow it back in different ways that you didn't even imagine. Uh, and, and it comes right on time when you need it. Going back to the stony uh, of the, adul uh, the adulteress, what God, what Jesus says to his disciples at the end is the, the goal of the book that I wrote. Jesus told his disciples, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follow me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Again, going back to everything we talked about already, about changing mindsets, uh, having better choices, you choose God first in your life. If you choose that, you will have God walking with you the rest of your life. And it will save you a whole lot of time, energy, money, relationships, and all of those things. Because God has it in mind for you. He's written the Bible. He wants you to read it. The book is designed to push you in that direction. It's not meant to replace. It's meant to direct and to guide and to give you alternatives. I know personally in my life, if I had came out the gate like Caleb and Austin and those, the young men in this church, if I knew God the way you do at this point, oh my God, I probably would have written five books by now. And I really, I really, you guys encourage me, you inspire me, because 
at my age, at your age, when I was your age, this was not what I was thinking about. This is not, this is not what I was thinking about. And you guys, you got one up on so many adults, it's not funny. So I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Keep going to your youth group. Keep doing Sunday services. Keep inspiring the young men around you to, to do what you do. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, from the outside, inside out, uh, again, is is written to direct young men primarily, but all men eventually to the path of Christ. This path is attainable, and God has given us the map. It is his word. Uh, by no means is my book a replacement, but rather a tool. And I mention you guys, and I have to say there's men, uh, young men like Austin, Caleb, John, and Nathan, uh, to lean in God's direction. And, uh, and when uh, making choices in your life, give God that chance. All right? My, my goal, too, after this, church service is to I canceled a uh, I'm at the end I was going to take a job somewhere else right after the contract so I'm going to be with uh, the river a little while longer and I canceled my plans it was a job where I could have made more money but I wanted to be available to do just this I wanted to be available to speak before people especially young men in trouble, uh, the youth. And so uh, God will provide, and I'm not worried about that anymore. I want to be available to do what, what, was, what was done this morning. So uh, without further ado, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. God bless you. But we are blessed, aren't we? We are blessed. Can I get everybody to stand this morning? I just want to give a challenge. Uh, I don't know about you, but I was challenged this morning. And uh, we've just hit the surface of what God's doing and what he's saying. And so let's, let's bow our heads and pray. And I want to ask God to speak to our hearts and for us to examine our, ourselves because what James was talking about this morning is choices. And so I believe that before we leave today that we have the opportunity, each and every one of us, whether you're a male or a female, young or old, each and every one of us have the opportunity to make a decision. We have the decision to choose whether we're gonna go there or not. And Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would just cause your spirit to rise up on the inside of us so that we can know where there is, that place that you're calling us to be. Because we don't need to go there, we need to go to you and help us to make the decision to go there. And, and Lord, you've challenged us this morning about mindsets, Lord God. And so, Lord, I pray that each and every one of us will make the decision to think on your word, to allow that to be the word that goes deep and is rooted and grounded in our lives. And Father, I pray too, Lord God, that we would follow the example that you gave in the life of Jesus for us to choose compassion, to choose mercy, and to choose justice. And Father, I believe that each and every one of us has a relationship somewhere. Each and every one of us have been touched someplace in our lives where we've held back and we're looking for justice. And Lord, you said that mercy triumphs over justice. And Lord, we all want to triumph in our life. And to triumph, we must choose mercy over justice. And so Lord, just speak to our hearts and allow us to release to you those individuals and whatever circumstances there may be that have stood in the way and Lord, help us to choose not to go there. Choose to think on whatsoever things are right and good and lovely and of good report. Help us to choose to believe the very, very best. And Lord, help us to choose to extend mercy to others in the same way that you extended mercy to us. And Father, we just thank you for this word today. Lord, 
we will not just be hearers, we will be doers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you.